from IIT Mandi. So I'm just giving a brief uh, bio of this. Uh, I think most of you have already have visited for me we are in the seminar. So Dr. Subhaji Chirwai Chaudhary completed his PhD from the Department of Electronics and uh, Telecommunication Engineering, Jagat University in year 2010. He is currently an assistant professor at the School of Computing and Electrical Engineering in IIT Mandi. He is a senior member of IEEE, he is a member of VLSS Society of India and life member of Indian Statistical Institute, Micro uh, Microelectronic Society of India, Institution of Electronic and Telecommunication Engineers and Telemedicine Society of India. Just to mention, he is, uh, he is awarded DIFA Young Faculty Award in the year 2016 and recently he is awarded Young Neurologist Award by World Stroke Organization. He has published over 100 papers in international journals and conferences. He has authored 5 books and book chapters. He has filed 5 patents and also has been granted 2 copyrights till date. And his, his research interests have spanned around the development of biomedical uh, embedded systems, non-invasive diagnostic systems, VLSI architectures, ASIC design of intelligent signal processing circuits. And he is keenly interested in the education system and its necessary transformation. So let's welcome Dr. Subhajit Rajchaudhary from IIT. Thank you, Dr. Vivek, for the introduction. Uh, so, uh, I have already been uh, having some interactions with some of the faculty members here at Tripathi Delhi, uh, mainly through Dr. Anubha, who was my sometime colleague when we were colleagues at Tripathi Hyderabad. And uh, after that, uh, I came, uh, once she moved to Tripathi Delhi and I moved to IIT Mandi, she has been visiting us and I also some, uh, once in a while visit Tripathi Delhi and over the uh, mutual exchange and transfer of people, we have a good amount of interaction with some of the faculty members over here. And uh, so as regards my research, uh, uh, I primarily work in the area of non-invasive diagnostic system that means I primarily work with patients where there is no puncture, suture or any pain involved in the process. It is an absolutely painless process but you can do under, understand the patient, monitor the different parameters of the patient. Uh, so uh, in this talk I am going to focus on mainly on the non-invasive uh, diagnostic systems but Non-invasive diagnostic systems uh, is a wide, uh, has a wide span. It can even mean MRI, CAT scan, PET scan, and whatever. But we are not going into those costly approaches which do not really make sense within in Indian context beyond a certain point. Uh, we are talking of that kind of level of monitoring which we really need to go and do at the grassroots levels in the villages in the block level, whatever, which are beyond uh, where uh, things like uh, CAT scan, PET scan, MRI are beyond the affordability. So we are trying to develop some point of care testing systems, some small portable kind of gadgets with which the patients can be diagnosed at the point of care and I shall tell you the stories of development of such systems in course of this lecture. Uh, since the lecture is on diagnosis, we will start with what is diagnosis, but let's um, take a little bit um, uh, time, a minute, to show you the our campus at IIT Mandi. So this is basically our uh, half of our campus. This is basically our campus is basically a 565 acres campus in the uh, Himalayas uh, at Mandi, and. Uh, this is basically one half of the campus, which we call the South Campus. Um, this is where my office is. Uh, I can show you my office with the laser pointer. But my residence is on the other side of this hill, which is, uh, so this hill is basically separating my home and the office, and I have to have a five kilometers uh, drive from my home to the office, going across this hill. So, um, the, uh, I would also acknowledge the support link by, the, uh, by my students over here. Some of them are belong to IIIT and some of them belong to IIT Mandi and since they are working and I am talking, I should acknowledge the support led by them. 
So, as I told you that I'm going to talk about uh, non-invasive diagnosis, so it also really makes sense to uh, start from the point where diagnosis is. I've tried to make the slides in such a way that 80% of the lecture will be understandable to most of the people, who, even those who are not in my area, but at least 20% of the talk will be focused on certain things which are in my area, um, um, and understandable to the people who are absolutely in my area. So that's how it will be a fair judgment for all the people sitting over here. So I start with the, what is diagnosis? Uh, now, if you go by the broad definition of the term, it basically refers to understanding the nature and cause of anything, and uh, which does not necessarily mean it is a medical diagnosis. It can be the diagnosis of faults in a circuit. It can be the diagnosis of some fault in some machines. It can be the diagnosis of some error in the software. So all these things are together called diagnosis, essentially meaning that we are basically trying to establish the causative relationships. So, given that we try to establish the positive relationship, there are three kinds of basic components associated with diagnosis. We have to identify the source of the problem, which is basically the identification part, and then you have to go for an analysis why this fault has happened, why, why this error has taken place, which means that there is an analysis process involved. In order to do this analysis, you have to use some kind of a tool, which is a logic, it can be the mathematical logic which the computer science people are very interested with, or it can be uh, any other kinds of logic. In the context of medical diagnosis, it, uh, diagnosis basically referred to identifying the nature and cause of the disease, and um, in medical terminology, we, uh, we have basically use different kinds of diagnosis such as clinical diagnosis uh, where we try to find out this, uh, the causes of the symptoms that we observe in patients and um, then uh, identifying the set of diseases through laboratory tests which we call laboratory diagnosis and similarly we have ECG diagnosis, EEG diagnosis and so on. So now when a patient visits a physician, what is the state of the earth practice? that the patient and the physician goes through. So when we visit a physician, we first report the physician of our problem in a very vague and abstract way in our own language. And it is a tough task for the physician to extract the meaningful information out of it and subject himself to a logical reasoning process as to what is the cause of the specific disease. Now the biggest problem is that many a times we feel that certain things are redundant to mention to the physician but they are really the sensible part of the information and therefore the physician has to repeatedly interview the patient, we sometimes get irritated when the physician keeps on asking things repeatedly, but mind you, the physician uh, is actually trying to extract useful information for his own business process. And therefore, this, these two things keep on looping when we really get irritated, but we shouldn't get, uh, when the patient or physician tries to identify the nature of the disease, the cause of its symptoms, and the patient keeps on reporting about the problems, and some informations come out of it, but the, for the remaining, the physician basically suggests a set of tests the, which the, uh, the patient has to go through before the physician can get some extra information out of it. And then, based on the history being provided, as well as the uh, test and the clinical thinking process, the physician makes some useful conjecture and inferences about the pathophysiological state of the patient and that actually gives insights for further analysis and therapeutic guidelines and procedures. To understand this uh, process of reasoning, let us take a very simple example. Let us consider some disease X, uh, X can be anything, such that 
75% of the patients suffering from the diseases, disease AIDS is curable by oral pills, capsules, tablets, whatever. 55% of the patients are curable by injections and only 35% of the people are curable by surgery. Now the results uh, seem to be a bit absurd because uh, our preconceived notion is just the opposite of it. Given that the capsules and tablets fell, the next step we go through is the process of intramuscular and intravenous injections. And if this also fails, then the third uh, thing that we go for is the surgery. But here the results being presented are just opposite. Can you tell me why it is so? I'd like to, the lecture to be in an interactive mode, in which means that you are most welcome to raise your hands at any point of time and throw questions on me. I'll be very glad to uh, accept your questions. We will not post from the questions in the end of the talk, but you are most welcome to ask me any question at any point of time. Can you answer this question, why the results are so? It also depends on whether it's a primary care or a secondary care. Uh, it depends upon? Primary care or a secondary care. I go to a general physician, generally I meet a general physician. Yeah. For example, for a fever or something. Mm -hmm. so, so that is for most of the cases. Mm -hmm. and secondary care is something like uh, disease like uh, cancer or something like that. Right? So that's basically a different type of care. So uh, this, which, which care you are actually talking about? So primary uh, care or a secondary care? We would uh, perhaps talk about the primary care because that's the type of the audience I'm targeting for because the ultimate objective is to drive the research into the grassroots levels of the society where people will be really benefited um, to use things in their everyday life and get their symptoms being diagnosed. Hmm? Yeah, but what is the reason behind it? Uh, well, uh, one of the possible answer can be that there may be three subtypes of the disease, A, B, and C, which we might not have been aware of. If you take, uh, take the case of hepatitis, hepatitis is a very good example. I mean, normally if you say jaundice or hepatitis, uh, that's what we normally use to say. But there is an altogether different therapeutic guideline for hepatitis A, B, C. Uh, so, subtype A may be best curable by oral pills or uh, tablets, whereas subtype B is best curable by surgery, whereas subtype C is best curable by injections. Now, what is the whole uh, rationale behind this whole exercise? We have to have adequate information as to classify the disease into its subtypes to get a clear picture of what should be the therapeutic guideline for the specific subtype of the disease. Now, this is essentially, there's a, in medical science, there's a specific terminology associated with it. They call it the differential diagnosis. You have to go on classifying the diseases into types and subtypes such that at each level you are going into a more detailed picture of what exact disease the patient is suffering from. That will give you a clearer insight of the specific therapeutic process the patient may be subjected to. So now if you have an understanding of the specific subtype of disease, you can see that the success rate has improved a lot because now you have a clearer understanding of the subtype of the disease. So the therapeutic success rate improved because of the refinement of the diagnosis. So a higher resolution of dividing a disease into subtypes into therapeutic success rates. Now, how do we obtain a higher resolution of diagnosis that is clinically relevant? So the traditional practices are you look into patient's history or profile given that someone goes with a fever, it's very important to see whether it's an influenza or malaria or pyloria or 
um, dengue or whatever. You have to do a stepwise analysis, as I already said, that at each step you have to find out the source or reason of it and whether it is giving for further classification of diseases or not. And that is uh, possible only through logic thinking, logical thinking. And then if you don't get answers uh, to your questions that come to your mind, you can go for further tests based on initial clinical findings. So here's a plethora of tests I needed for diagnosis and what can be the right approach for it. So we have uh, two traditional approaches for diagnosis. Uh, one is the invasive approach and the other one is the non-invasive approach. In invasive approach, some puncture or suture has to be made in the, some part of the body. Um, typical examples are the blood tests. Uh, when we go to some papula for a blood test, our fingers are punctured or we take out the blood from some artery and uh, uh, some vein, sorry, not artery. And then uh, we subject it to a process of uh, pathological test in the lab. But anyhow, there's a pain involved in the process. Similarly, in case of a biopsy, we basically remove some tissue or organs from part of the body and we do some elaborate te test analysis with it. Those who are into cancer research, they are more into this biopsy thing where some tissues have to be removed from the body to analyze and get an answer of whether the tissue is carcinogenetic or not. And the main problem is there's a pain involved in the patients and the more important thing is that experts are needed in the sample collection process because there is a chance of infection associated with the sample collection. A better approach would be a non-invasive diagnosis where there is no puncture, no suture and no pain involved. But again the question lies is, are experts needed in the process? So if you see the history of diagnosis, it's a very old practice started with this great old uh, man, Hippocrates in Greece, who is called the father of uh, medicine. And, uh, and whenever an MBBS student graduates, he has to take the Hippocratic Oath. Um, he has to really go through this Hippocratic Oath before getting the award of his degree. And, uh, a lot of uh, ancient Greek and Italian doctors, they basically gave uh, some activities of diagnosis, some of which are even followed nowadays. But the modern uh, diagnostic uh, approaches based on instruments uh, started in the 17th or 18th century with uh, uh, one of the earliest one is with uh, Lenin coming up with this approach of using a stethoscope to hear the heart sounds. Uh, and uh, then there were people like Fahrenheit who invented the thermometer, Leeuwenhoek who invented this microscope, uh, but even whatever microscopy uh, research that is going on are basically owes its origin to what Leeuwenhoek did in the, at the end of the 17th century. So, now over time, this uh, non-invasive diagnostic approaches uh, made a lot of advancements uh, with uh, imaging techniques such as this ultrasonic imaging where you use ultrasonic waves to understand the morphology of various visceral organs in our body. By visceral I say, uh, I talk about me basically those organs which are not externally visible but they can be diagnosed by application of various waves and observing the reflected wave pattern. Then you have this CAT scan where uh, you do some kind of tomographic analysis to understand the morphological forms of various organs. Similarly, you have the MRI scan. But again, the big question is, uh, you have the PET scan also. Now the big question is, um, can these diagnoses be done without experts intervention also? You need a physician, an MRI expert physician who is a radiologist 
not just an NB based degree holder. Some radiologist has to be there to accurately give the, I mean, accurately set the uh, gradient field of the MR to get the correct information regarding the morphology of various organs. So, if you see the problem with the state of the earth approaches, one is obviously the high cost associated with it. I mean, an MR costs a few crores, uh, which is beyond the affordability of uh, the villages, uh, village based health care centers and sub centers. And, uh, and even if it is implemented, do patients visit the health care center regularly for scanning and monitoring? Forget about the villages. Let us ask ourselves. How many times when we have problem, given that I make the healthcare facility free, how many times when we have problem, we go to the healthcare centers? At our IIT campus, we have a healthcare center funded by the central government. All of us have a free healthcare support. Suppose I have a fever, the first thing that I will do is I will take a calcul or a crocin and instead of going to the healthcare center to get myself checked up. And that is a human intrinsic nature. We are always uh, lazy to go uh, pay a visit to the physician and we always try to be our own doctor. So if we try to be our own doctor, why not we do a little bit tweaking to become our own doctor? That's my point. So if you look at the Indian scenario, then I am presenting the data of the National Rural Health Mission 2013. Uh, so 700 million Indians live in 636,000 villages. If you see the percentage of doctors, of the total set of doctors, only 2% of the doctors stay in the rural areas which has created an unwarranted ratio of 10,000 patients to one physician in the rural areas. This is the real problem. There you won't have the Apollo hospital, there you won't have the Fortis hospital, whatever. If you remove the healthcare center that is there in the IIT campus, then we have to travel for more than 20 kilometers before we can catch hold of a doctor and a hospital in the Mandi town. We, uh, I mean, our IIT campus, some of your faculty members have already visited uh, and some students have also visited our IIT campus. It is in a remote location in the hills. So, if you want to go to the Mount Mundi town, the only available conveyance is the IIT bus and uh, you have to travel for some 18 to 23 kilometers depending upon whether you are in south or north campus to reach to the Mundi town. So and this is exclusive out here, private hospitals, right? This data. Yeah. Private hospitals are mostly in the centered in the Sequence. 66% uh, of the rural Indians do not have any access to critical medicine. 31% of the population travel for more than 30 kilometers seeking health care in rural India. 22 million population are pushed below the poverty line annually due to health care expenditure only. 40% of hospitalization expenditure is funded by borrowed money or sold assets. But the strangest thing is that preventable and curable diseases dominate the morbidity pattern, which means that whatever critical diseases are there, if they can be diagnosed and cured on time, lots of lives could have been saved. So this looks like more of your primary care you are talking about. Yes. Right? Yes. So we started with, uh, this was during the days of my PhD where we part of developing a system which can predict the future pathophysiological state of the patient 
give you the current and past the, the data and we uh, basically uh, accepted the data of patients and subjected to a process of diagnostic reasoning using fuzzy logic and uh, uh, we basically subjected the patient uh, the data to a algorithm for diagnosis and in that process we basically indexed into the few uh, previous history of the patients which has been profiled in, into the patient base and then we got decisions regarding whether the patient is tending towards a critical situation or not. The essence of the system is that much before a critical condition takes place, the system can predict whether the patient is tending towards a critical condition. So we did the elaborate mathematical modeling of it and got an indication whether the patient is logging towards a critical condition or not. And ultimately, well, once we developed the mathematical model, we also developed the system on board. This is the system, uh, system uh, board which I have designed myself and got it fabricated uh, with the help of Ultra Cyclone FTJ Chief also. And uh, this board is worth of less than 1000 rupees uh, because with all these indigenous components except for this Ultra Cyclone Chief. And uh, so the essence of the system is that it uh, basically accepts the data offline because at that time we didn't do the sensor integration of it. Uh, but because we had some kind of patient profiling, we could uh, predict the future pathophysiological state of a patient given the current and past pathophysiological data. And we got an accuracy of diagnosis that was 87.5% uh, uh, to start with, which was uh, considered to be a somewhat low uh, value on the lower side, even though we got it accepted in the journal. Later on, we basically worked uh, on the renal data of patients uh, uh, the consisting of BMI, glucose, urea, creatinine, systolic, and diastolic blood pressure. Prediction of, prediction of uh, whether a person is staying towards a critical renal condition. So much before a renal failure occurs, if it can be predicted, and I mean, uh, when the renal failure occurs, it actually becomes irreversible. So, so you already had data categorized yes. different categories, whether it is mild, it is moderate, moderate, moderate. and then you system. So yes. it will really be so Yes. So initially we worked with this uh, renal data. And then we actually extended this model to pulmonary spirometry where we also analyzed the data from for uh, people working in the industrial areas, factories where you have a lot of emission of carbon monoxide and carbon particles with the smoke which we inhale and that blocks our um, tracheal and bronchial pathway leading to respiratory problems. So then we actually uh, understood the various problems uh, with our simplified uh, model and uh, we went into type 2 fuzzy sets for our diagnostic purposes which in, uh, incorporated the intra-expert as well as inter-expert variability and uh, then uh, we also refined on the inferencing engine based on this Mandani's inferencing model and uh, with the same uh, kind of uh, patients being used and we reached a diagnostic accuracy of 98.75%. Um, and finally we also developed a on-chip ASIC of the whole thing. I mean, if some males of people is there, then we appreciate it. So we basically developed our own chip comprising of uh, which access this patient data and uh, then uh, so the uh, processing circuit, inferencing engine, everything has been integrated on this chip and we got it fabricated through the IMAC Belgium. And uh, I actually use this, this is the circuit which we have uh, developed uh, as a three, our three transistor ZOR gate. At that time it was the uh, XOR gate with the lowest transistor count. Um, and using with it, uh, we developed this eight transistor full adder. Later on, uh, last to last year, one of my MS students further cut it down to two transistors or get, which we got accepted in the Journal of Low Power Electronics. And uh, so, with that, we could develop a six transistor full adder. So, until 2013, nobody used to, uh, people used to consider this work to be a trash. 
now uh, I think in 2013 we got the first citation. This paper was published. Uh, Sri Pranister Zorbek was published in 2008. So for the first five years we felt that okay this work was a trash. The first citation came in 2013. Now almost every month we see the citation count going by two, three, two, three like that. Now this is another work that we did uh, post PhD where we uh, analyzed an ECG signal to find out uh, the QRS complex and based on this uh, QRS complex station we could predict various things like uh, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular arrhythmia and uh, supraventricular tachycardia and arrhythmia. So all this, uh, now the point is that when you have a uh, tachycardia, for example, it is very important to know whether it is a ventricular tachycardia or a supraventricular tachycardia, which calls for two different therapeutic guidelines and processes. Again, comes from the example of disease X classified into A, B, and C that, that I told in the beginning. So it is very important to know, you know uh, looking at the QRS complexes, as to whether uh, what is the size of this QRS complex and what is the frequency at which these QRS complexes are appearing and what is the actual shape of these QRS complexes. So we actually use the, the notion of fuzzy entropy to detect these QRS complexes and uh, then using this uh, fuzzy entropy we could uh, identify the QRS complexes with an accuracy of 98.5% and uh, 200 patients have been diagnosed for Tachycardia and tachycardia, and we could basically classify it into ventricular and supraventricular cases. So this work was published in the Journal of Medical Systems. Now I am coming to some real story of a patient named Aha, who was a 12 years old girl. She fell down from a long rock while climbing and uh, she had already an irreversible brain damage and this was at some place called Mukut Manipur I, I don't know whether any Bengali out here I'm from Bengal so uh, this is a, so this is a place uh, it's a popular tourist destination in Bengal it's a place uh, with hills uh, surrounding the lake and a lot of uh, Bengalis like to go on a weekend outing to there but it's a kind of a resort like place. This girl, while jumping or moving into a rock, she fell off from the rock and had an injury in the head. And this girl could not survive the head injury. She died in another five years when she was rushed to the Bangor Institute of Neuroscience in Kolkata. That was a five hours drive and she died on the way. Had the scan been done on time, she could have already been saved. Now, Ahar's case is not the... So, if you see the uh, kind of... Uh, this is basically the MRI scan of her um, brain. And this is basically the site of the damage. You can see the hemorrhage known as the white patch over here. So, this, uh, in medical terms, we call it a, a traumatic brain injury or TBI. Now the point is that this TBI initially starts off with a small uh, patch or even less than a patch, a small dot. Now that is called the umbral region. So the blood comes, uh, so there is a rupture of some point in the cerebrovascular artery, blood comes out of it. Now the point is that as the blood comes out of it, the pressure of blood inside the cerebrovascular artery keeps on falling. Now, as the pressure of the blood in the cerebrovascular artery keeps on falling, the oxygen supply by the blood to the tissues in the brain, namely the grey matter and the white matter, keeps on falling over time. Now, of the cells in our body, the brain cells are the most sensitive of the cells because it requires a constant supply of oxygen. So, the, so when our body dies, the brain dies at the earliest because of the want of oxygen. So, so this is actually a rapid development process even though it starts out with a small dot 
the area which stops getting the supply of oxygen over time because of the lack of transport of blood keeps on dying over time and slowly you have more and more area of the brain dying out and ultimately when it goes to a beyond some threshold the patient dies. So it is very important for a patient with a traumatic brain injury to, to be diagnosed within an hour or so for the location of the injury and it has and the hemorrhagic point has to be removed and the rupture be cleared. Um, a couple of weeks back, you might have seen in the newspaper that one of our students, uh, he went to take some selfie on the bank of the Ul River near our campus and he slipped off some rock and had a head injury and he died of the head injury. I mean, uh, somehow he called his friends from the hostel room both the friends refused to turn up um, but he thought that he should have a own alone selfie session he went to the, down to the river to take his own photographs whatever without the consent of anybody and he died of the head so I now Akha's case is not just alone and uh, we have millions of such cases across the world. The other part of the truth is India has only one MRI scanner per million of population in the world, one of the lowest in the world for reasons which we all know. So, and on, unfortunately, neurologic disability is going to be a hidden epidemic for our country and uh, currently the figures are this affecting over 3.5 million people annually and if you take the average it is 11,000 per day which means amounts to 7 people per minute. So it requires for some kind of a diagnostic process being introduced. It's a global issue actually. So this patient had some headache and she thought that uh, she, uh, she basically took some sedative for treatment um, but instead of the sedative curing her headache, she basically died because she had a hemorrhage and that hemorrhage could not be diagnosed on time and she had a lack of oxygen supply in her brain and she died. Even emergency department doctors miss 40 to 50 percent of the neurological diagnosis. This is, these are the uh, so called uh, well developed hospitals I am talking about, not the peripheral health care centers. So now we understand that people are always like to become their own doctors and they are reluctant to visit the healthcare centers. So why don't we do the alternate way of thinking that instead of patients reaching out to diagnostic centers, can diagnosis reach out to the patients? So I always have an example of the story of Macbeth. Some of you must, might have read about Macbeth, right? So in Macbeth, uh, what did the witch say to Macbeth? That Macbeth will die when the forest in front of the castle will move towards the Macbeth's castle. And Macbeth was very happy that uh, a forest can never move and so is not going to die. Unfortunately, when the people in his country became so irritated with Macbeth, they cut the trees and carried the tree logs in their hand appeared as if the entire forest is moving towards Macbeth's castle. I am using the same story in a positive sense. Instead of diagnostic centers being visited by patients, can we have a diagnostic center being set up at home? So that actually brings us to this notion of point of care diagnosis, uh, where tests are designed to be used or at or near the patient's premises that do not require any permanent dedicated space, uh, space and can be performed outside the physical facilities of the clinical laboratories. And this is, goes by the definition of the American College of Pathology. And so if you see the trend, starting from a more formal setting in a hospital or a pathology or a clinic, the diagnostic process is gradually shifting towards the more informal settings at home or non-medical facilities where we do not have adequate uh, facilities uh, in terms of cleanliness or precision, accuracy, whatever, but still we can do the monitoring and 
at least do the screening and monitoring at an initial level. And so from highly complex tests, you are evolving things and gradually developing some waived set of tests which do not require very adequate kind of process which can be handled by a patient himself or some near and dear ones at home. So we essentially went for rapid uh, testing of pathophysiological parameters which uh, call for home monitoring of parameters. And a host lot of parameters uh, we found out can be diagnosed at home like that. Uh, all of us know that India is going to be the diabetic capital of the world down the line. And we really need to have a very elaborate process of diagnosing the glucose. Just, uh, I mean, today, uh, today only one of my colleagues, uh, when I was just discussing with Dr. Muha, research, one of my colleagues just called me that uh, he is basically a control systems expert. He was telling me that can we join hands together and develop some closed loop glucose monitoring system so that because uh, diabetes doesn't mean that there's an elevation of blood glucose level and those who keep on constantly telling me that Bengalis like to have a lot of sugar and sweet, there's other part of the story that a lot of people are there who go into critical condition because of lack of intake of sugar. So there are just as hyperglycemia is a serious thing to be monitored and be careful about, there's the opposite side, there's hypoglycemia for which one has to be very critical about if the glucose level falls below 60 milligram per deciliter of blood, it basically puts one into a very critical condition. So, we are, I mean, at IIIT we used to have one patient who used to alternately switch between hypoglycemic and hyperglycemic cases, so she all had to maintain a stock of insulin as well as glucon G at home. I will, uh, if you recall Anubha, I am basically referring to Soma's mother-in-law, who used to constantly switch between the hypoglycemic and hyperglycemic cases. So these are very critical things to consider. But agree, a lot of uh, uh, Things are available at home, like for example, a pin trick is always there for you to, to monitor your blood. Very easily that can be used to, except for the fact that you have to keep on pricking with the pin to yeah. just... Uh, this pin pricking thing, uh, I actually tell you, there are two parts of it. One is uh, you have to ensure that the pin is uh, infection free, that's a big point in question over there. Uh, even though you use AccuSure or whatever other companies that have come up with. The other part is, uh, uh, given that there's a pain involved in it, people do not really do the regular monitoring which needs to be done. For a diabetic patient, it is very important that the patient be monitored at least four times in a day, if not more, to, uh, to get an estimate of the blood glucose level. So what is the present technology under the... So, uh, one is this uh, state of the art practice is, uh, that is going on in the society is uh, have a glucometer at home. Now two things are there, one is the infection involved and the pain involved in the process for which people get um, irritated with it at some point of time. The other thing is that those paper strips on which you put the blood for an insert in the glucometer, those paper strips are also quite costly. So, so even for the paper, you refer to the prick and then put yeah, the blood. Yeah. So you cannot avoid uh, pin pricking as of now to monitor your glucose level. What are the instruments you may need? Sir, yeah. there have been some wireless glucose. Yeah, wireless one. Uh, so this mobile the apps, uh, I tell you, this mobile yeah. apps are really very bad. I read an article. In fact, in my mobile phone, I have an app show you that it will not, it will give, uh, I mean, if I do the monitoring, every uh, second time you do the monitoring, you will get a different reading altogether, which will have almost zero cor correlation with what you used to have before. So, uh, the point is that uh, they do some kind of where practice for them. Yes. 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 
So, so we are basically trying to use this photoplethysmography where we are basically using a set of LEDs and photo detectors and developing some kind of a clip you wear in your finger to near infrared radiation coming from the LED and then uh, either you put the photo detector on the same side or on the different side and then uh, do the monitoring of the particular book parameter. The catch is that each of the different parameter of the blur is responsive to a different part of the spectrum. Like there is some uh, wavelength at which there is peak absorption for hemoglobin. There is some wavelength for which you have a peak absorption for glucose. There is some wavelength for which you have a peak absorption for blood urea. But the problem is not so simple as I'm telling here right now because if, it, if I say that uh, at some wavelength you have a peak response for one parameter, it doesn't mean that zero response for the other parameter and that actually needs uh, the help of signal processing work where you need to use some kind of blind signal separation to separate out the interferences due to the other components. So, so essentially when you do this plethysmography, you basically get a waveform like this. You can see a notch over here that is basically called the diacrotic notch because of the retrograde flow of blood during the ventricular contraction process. Now this is an ideal PPG waveform and we expect the waveform to be like this. But in reality, if you see, uh, the waveform looks something like this, what we got. Um, so this, uh, so this is basically the first work that we did in the area of this photoplethysmography with one of my students who is now in his MS at Penn State, uh, Chetan, basically. So, uh, so we basically got the signal like this and then uh, we basically de developed some adaptive filter with which we could learn the motion artifacts that are introduced into the signal because of movement in of the hands in x, y and z directions and we use an accelerometer to detect the motion and then we did the um, noise cancellation and after filtering we got the signal like this. Now if you see this plethysmography process then uh, Suppose this is the LED, it is basically giving a radiation, a part of the radiation is getting reflected from the surface of the skin, uh, then a part of it is passing to the capillaries and is received by the photodiode on the other side, a part of it is received, uh, a part of it is basically scattered in the capillaries, which we call the uh, scattering followed by absorption, and then there is a diffuse reflection followed by absorption and then there is a diffuse transmission you are not able to detect the part. So only a small part of the signal that is actually received by the photo detector on the other side and therefore you really need to give a reasonably large gain through a low noise instrumentation amplifier so that before you could get signals of reasonable amplitude. So using this technique, we could uh, we have developed a uh, systems that can monitor a host lot of pathophysiological parameters. Currently, we have separate systems for each of the parameters, and now we are in the process. We are thinking to have some integrated systems, as that you wear one gadget and you get individual values uh, of the different parameters. So there are lots of issues. I mean, it is not that uh, I'll just put the LEDs in an array and you get the values because there is always an interference of radiation involved, so um, again, we have to use the notion of geometric optics over there to deal with the uh, radiation coming from different LEDs and how to deal with the beats and interferences over there. So, uh, let's keep I think so, people use PPG also to find out, like, as you put already the heart. It is also possible for you to determine the classify various types of tachycardia and tachycardia which you project yeah. yeah. Is it possible to do that actually? Because uh, even with, with ECG, it's possible to. We do have that. done it at the uh, Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences in Hyderabad, where we have actually worked with cardiac patients in the ICU, 
under the supervision of a cardiologist over there. And uh, we have actually got good results. Using a PPT, it's possible for you to classify different uh, yes. heart pathologies. Yes. And using fingertip photopathy we particularly monitored patients for uh, coronary artery disease, myocardial infarction, coronary angina, all these diseases. So, how is it? So, what? you are saying that different these parameters they change from one disorder to another? Yes. So, we basically, for uh, coronary artery diseases, we basically monitored the uh, oxyhemoglobin content in the blood. So, when you have oh, a. This is HPO. Yeah, HPO2. No. My question basically is when you take a ECG, you look at the time series. Yes. And the PQR waveform tells you basically what sort of, uh, you're, you're a very trained physician, can very easily make it, what sort of uh, problems you have, whether it's a touchy or your. Yes. But in the, so you do have a very clear PQR space in ECG, right? So that, when it changes, then people can very easily make it. Yes. Every RR signals, uh, you can very easily make it. Yeah. But in the case of your PPT, mm. you don't have only one small notch. Okay. Yeah. How does but that notch actually gives a lot of information. So what is, how do you actually so use that notch to get your variation? So for example, in case of a coronary artery disease, uh, this uh, closure of the aortic and pulmonic valves at the end of the ventricle takes place for an extended duration of time. And because of which there is an extended duration for which there is a retrograde flow of blood. That actually makes this uh, notch, yeah, that actually makes this notch exist for a longer period of time. So, uh, so every time you get this waveform, some error in this waveform, you have to actually relate the error in the waveform to the specific physiology the physiological background of it and that will actually give you the answer to the question. So again, if it is waveform, it has to be the Yeah. So, uh, it's okay? No, I mean, two things. One is, you have to decide on, uh, you have to um, have an understanding of the physiology that what parameters are getting altered because of this problem. So, should I monitor the blood urea level for uh, coronary artery disease or should I monitor the oxyhemoglobin level for coronary artery disease? That is one question we need to answer. The second is, given that we have chosen a particular parameter, how is the parameter getting altered during the, I mean, given a patient has a particular disease? And how is it affecting the shape of the waveform? Either, I mean, the information may be in the time domain, information may be in the frequency domain. Uh, sodium potassium, I tell you, is a, 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 another issue that is uh, sodium potassium are most responsive to the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Now, with, if you use al now ultraviolet monitoring, also we have done, but then that requires a lot of engineering in the sense that our skin is very sensitive to the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. So when you are doing this plethysmograph uh, using the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, you have to use uh, appropriate uh, optical filters to ensure that those wavelengths that cause harm to the skin should not penetrate through your skin. Now most of these LEDs, even though they say that it is giving a peak response at so and so wavelength, it is also giving radiations at other wavelengths. And if you are doing an ultraviolet part of the spectrum, you should be very precise about the particular wavelength at which you are doing the monitoring, the other wavelengths shouldn't come because there is a large part of the ultraviolet part of the spectrum to which our skin is not really very friendly to and leads to a lot of other problems. Uh, skin conductance measurements are much better than the optical measurements. There is a uh, uh, time for which There is a time for which uh, people have been trying out uh, doing the impedance plethysmography measurements. Right. Now, one of the biggest issue with the impedance plethysmography measurement is that uh, issues with uh, skin contact 
is a severe problem. So people have tried out with uh, gold electrodes, which is very expensive. There's a silver silver chloride electrodes with electrolytic gel. The problem with this electrolytic gel is that uh, our skin is very irritant to the electrolytic gel and it processes, uh, it creates some kind of a itching sensation in the skin after some time and the moment the itching sensation happens, the patient starts moving the fingers back and forth. It's something like you get the sensation, same sensation when an ant stings in your skin. So, so it is very, uh, I mean, a lot of motion artifacts get introduced to it. It has to be an extremely robust system to compensate for the motion artifacts being introduced. But still, you cannot use PTP as a gold standard in At this stage, we are, uh, we will be very happy if it can be used as a screening and monitoring device. I am not saying that I am, uh, I am not saying that making a proposal that we should wipe out the notion of patholabs and have uh, this uh, PPG and neuroinfrared spectroscopy as a gold standard. But given that there are 10,000 patients for one physician in the rural areas, can we have this kind of pocket handle gadgets which can identify the real critical patients and suggest them to the referral centers at the nearby cities or towns or whatever. Yeah, I'll try to wrap up in another 10 minutes. Now, we wanted to extend the notion of this uh, monitoring of different parameters uh, of the body to the diagnosis of the brain also and we chose to extend this notion of neuro infrared spectroscopy and uh, but then there are some pertinent questions you know, the state of the art practice is to use an MR as a tool to diagnose the brain uh, while the MR gives a better spatial resolution than needs the needs of is found to give a better temporal resolution than MR now, with knees on the other hand, you will get information only from the cerebral cortex, the surface of the brain. What about the depth, cerebral medulla? Even MR also doesn't give good results with the cerebral medulla. So currently, we are actually trying with a low-cost, low magnetic field MR system, where we are trying to get rid of the bulky, the superconducting magnet, and we are basically using Elmore spoil to develop the MR. So this is a project which has been taken up by five of uh, me and my four of my colleagues at IIT Mandi, along with uh, three physicians at PGI near Chandigarh and three other colleagues at IIT Roper. So we are basically trying to develop this low cost low magnitude MR and uh, initially we thought that uh, we should have this MRI embedded in a suitcase or so but now we, after a lot of calculations over the past one year we came to understand it won't be in a suitcase but it will be in a car <laughs> that is research so from the from suitcase our idea has moved to a car so that, these are the questions that come to my mind do we need 1.5 tesla magnet for this uh, low cost MR uh, we found that uh, we could do the monitoring for limbs and for the brain at as low as 0.2 tesla magnetic field. What about the wobbling frequency? So that is again a question that we are trying to get an answer to that uh, the, we are uh, trying to sort out a particular frequency corresponding to this 0.2 tesla magnetic field such that we can have RF coils at that frequency. And what is the requirement for voxel and pixel density? So, uh, people like Dr. Anuha has to give me good answers to these questions. So, if you see the global technology gap, while uh, we have been developing so many pocket devices for monitoring a whole lot of parameters, there is no such device which could monitor the brain at the point of care and that is what we are trying to address. So we really need to have some kind of an ambulatory care uh, for, uh, for monitoring the brain 
And with that objective in mind, we basically developed this hat of the cat um, with which we could monitor the hemodynamics of the cerebrovascular artery. But then the cerebrovascular artery is quite deep seated in the frontal and the frontal lobe of the brain. So the signal amplitude is very low. So we are basically giving an anodal transcranial direct current stimulation where we are keeping the anode at the CZ side of the skull and cathode at FT and F4 side of the skull and subjecting the patient to a low DC current stimulation of 0.526 ampere per meter square at which case you get uh, signals of reasonably large amplitude and uh, so this is basically the dynamics of the cerebral oxygenation level we found over time we basically did a mod modeling of the system using a fourth order control system and then uh, we checked the dynamics of this model as against the experimental results we saw using the correlation and we recruited uh, around uh, um, 14 patients from the Institute of uh, Neurosciences Kolkata and uh, we saw the change in the cerebral oxygenation level with and without anodal transcranial direct stimulation. The essence of this approach is that uh, with uh, healthy patients, we could see that there is a sudden, there is a jump in the cerebral oxygenation level post uh, stimulation, whereas for patients having stroke or a history of a transient ischemic attack or cerebral hemorrhagic attack, there was hardly any change in the cerebral oxygenation level post application of uh, this anodal transcranial direct current stimulation, and this can be used as a biomarker to classify between the stroke and the non-stroke patients or potentially potential stroke patients. So, also the yes. So, a couple of hours before the cerebral attack, I mean, loosely we say cerebral attack, there can be multiple reasons for cerebral attack. It can be a hemorrhagic attack, which means there's a, a pump rupture happens in some part of the cerebrovascular artery and blood gushes out of it because of which there's a fall in the cerebral oxygenation level. There can be a transient ischemic attack, which means there is some kind of constriction being developed in the cerebrovascular artery because of which there is a fall of flow rate of blood to the cerebrovascular artery, which also leads to a cerebral attack. Couple of hours before the attack actually happens, there is a decrease in the flow rate of blood in the cerebrovascular artery, and if it can be monitored on time, then appropriate stimulation which we called uh, non-invasive brain stimulation or NIBS may be applied to the patient to reverse the cause of this uh, flow rate of blood 